Well, hello, YouTube, and welcome back. Today on the table, we have something that's certainly more than meets the eye. This 61-inch RCA HD 61 LPW42 flat screen DLP rear projection television set is not only the largest and oldest digital rear projector I've ever owned, but has a number of other bragging rights, including a possible claim to fame as the first smart TV, and also the source of a number of very interesting stories that you'll hear in today's video. Today's video could have just been a rambling on about technical specifications and watching me turn on a TV set and talk about the menus and then turn it back off, but I'd be doing the audience a disservice because there's actually a great number of interesting stories here. In fact, there's so much content that this is actually going to be split up into two separate videos. What you're watching now is the review and tour, but in the near future I will also be uploading a technical and repair video for those of you with greater interest in the technology or repair of your own equipment. But that's enough prerequisite stuff. This set is a 61 inch single chip DLP rear projection television set with a 1280 by 720p resolution powered by the Texas Instruments HD2 DLP chip. Now the way I came to possess this set is probably interesting in and of itself. You see, we had recently taken a vacation to a family vacation shack where this set had been in service from around 2005 to 2014 or so when the last spare lamp that they had in it finally died. After we visited in summer of 2015, the family kindly asked us if we would like to get rid of it for them and we told them that we would be willing to help them out with that. Assuming I just needed a new lamp, I figured that it would be an easy $20 investment and a quick turnaround. The first challenge was transportation. We've never transported anything this large in our van before, and after a quick crunching of the numbers, I found that there was no way it was going to fit. It's simply too tall. However, after taking a closer look, I found that it could be partly disassembled and transported in multiple pieces. And this actually isn't as bad as it sounds. It basically just consisted of pulling the back cover off, removing the faceplate, then removing the screen, and that gave me access to the screws inside of the upper cabinet, securing the upper cabinet to the lower cabinet. From there, it was just a matter of removing the upper cabinet from the lower cabinet, temporarily putting the screen back on the separated upper cabinet, putting the upper cabinet upside down into the back of the van, and then putting the lower cabinet next to it right side up in the back of the van. After we arrived back home, I used the air compressor to clean out as much dust as I could, and also cleaned the lower mirror inside of the lower cabinet. After I got everything back together, I ordered a new 260962 third-party projection lamp from a lamp store on Amazon.com, as I had done in the past, with many of the digital rear projectors that you've seen on the channel before, and it arrived a few days later. I installed it right away, and the set powered right up, but it became obvious after this that there was another problem, which I go over in great detail in the technical video. After an embarrassingly long repair process, I finally got it working and was able to sit down and play some Xbox 360 on it. Unfortunately, that was short-lived. It only lasted around 45 minutes before a dark egg-shaped patch started growing in the middle of the screen. I almost didn't even notice it at first until it got so large that the entire set was almost unwatchable. My initial research on the issue led me to believe that this may have been caused by a collapsed light tunnel, which is common on these sets. But the problem with that is collapsed light tunnels usually manifest as dark shadows on the edges of the screen with straight edges, not egg-shaped blobs of darkness starting in the center of the screen. When I dug into it, I found that there was actually an acrylic condenser lens that had been burned to a crisp by the cheap third-party lamp. This doesn't happen very often, and there's actually only a few references to it online, but as you can see in these photos that I was able to take, looking into the inner half of the light engine, the burn spot is clearly and obviously visible. 
because of the unusual nature of the problem and the already old and relatively uncommon nature of the set, there is no way to replace this lens. The entire light engine must be replaced, which is normally completely cost prohibitive. However, I thought I would contact the lamp store and see if they would like to maybe make it right and give me a new light engine. And to my surprise, they actually did just that. While we were at it, I also had them give me a name brand lamp instead of a cheap aftermarket one so that we wouldn't have to deal with another burned up light engine. The result has been nothing short of impressive. Not only does the new light engine not have over a decade of dust caked in on and around it, and a worn out whiny color wheel, this whole experience has changed my entire outlook on projection lamps. You see, up until this point, I had never understood the difference between inexpensive third-party lamps and name-brand first-party ones. But after putting that new lamp and light engine in there and seeing the massive difference in brightness, I think it's pretty safe to consider me a convert to first-party name-brand lamps. We'll start the physical tour here on the business end of the back of the set. Starting on the left here, we have something that I always like to see, a detachable power cord. It's just a standard three-prong computer power cord. To the right of that, we have the I.O. area. The first two inputs are just standard def, composite, or S-video. And then the third and fourth are composite or component video. Next to that, we have a DVI port with analog audio inputs which is actually completely bogus, and I'll go over why that is later in the video, and I'll cover the entire topic in depth in the technical video. But for now, we'll just continue along. On top of that, we have some handy audio I.O., and actually pretty fancy stuff for a standard TV set. It has external speaker outputs, standard line level outputs, and a center speaker input. So if your sound is all run through a surround sound system, and you want to use the television set's built-in speakers as your center speaker instead of trying to balance a center speaker on top of the set and having it fall down and all sorts of other terrible stuff, you can just plug the audio leads into here. On the bottom here we have composite video output, digital audio output, two standard coaxial inputs, one of which includes an ATSC and QAM tuner. And then underneath those, we have some of the connectivity that represents the basis for some of this set's more interesting features. On the right, we have FireWire ports, so you can hook up a FireWire hard drive or video device to record video onto or watch video off of, and an Ethernet port, which allows you to connect this television to the Internet, not only to receive software updates, but also to browse the web which I will demonstrate here in a little bit. On the right side here we have the lamp compartment and the model information sticker. And going back to the front here we have a number of other interesting things to look at. On the top obviously we have the 61 inch projection screen surrounded by a thin silver plastic bezel. And underneath that we have this nice fancy shiny and I might add well aged faceplate. I mean, just looking at the front of this, you wouldn't guess that it is over 10 years old. In fact, this aspect of the design alone actually gives it a rather modern look. There's also a rather impressive sound system hidden behind that shiny bezel. I didn't even know this until I tore the thing down to transport it, but there's actually a three-speaker array for each side that consists of a woofer, mid-range, and what appears to be a tweeter, giving it a total of 15 watts per side for a total sound output power of 30 watts, which, while still not quite as impressive as the Toshiba 52HM84's 40 watt system, does still sound very nice. Finally, we have the front panel buttons, which consist of nothing more than the power key, menu, volume, and channel controls. This is actually one of the few areas where this set differs from its higher-end Senium line counterpart. While the Senium series has a small blue light that shines down from that lip that hangs over the buttons, illuminating the keys in the dark, this model is not as richly equipped. Yeah. 
And with that, we will now go ahead and power it up. While it's doing that, we'll take a quick look at the remote. The remote is pretty standard, circa 2003 RCA issue. Again, this is one of the other areas where this model deviates from the higher end Senium series, in that this one only has a standard silver remote, but the Senium series comes with a fancy remote that does the exact same thing, but is shiny. However, as far as I know, the remotes are interchangeable. Anyway, as far as reviews go, the people are pretty well split on this one. Many criticize the small buttons, but praise the ergonomics. I tend to not mind the small buttons that much. What actually bothered me more than anything was the fact that there's only one input button and no on-screen menu system for selecting the inputs. So if you're on input 5 and you want to go to input 4, you got to press the button over and over again to cycle through all the other sources. Instead of there being an up and down source button like there is on the Mitsubishis or an on-screen menu system like there is on many other types of sets. Turning our attention back to the unit, we'll talk about power on times here real quick. From the time you press the power button to the time there is a visible picture on the screen, it's about 15 seconds. The lamp has warmed up to a watchable level by around 30 seconds and is up to full brightness by around 50 to 65 seconds, which is about average as far as these rear projection sets go. Now before we go any further, I'd like to take this time to talk about a serious technical limitation that is inherent with these sets and ways in which that can affect the viewing experience. To understand this, we need to see the situation from a circa 2003 perspective. And that is that at that time, rear projection was largely still CRT based. When they built this line of DLP rear projector sets, they were kind of in a crunch for time because they wanted to compete with Samsung. So they outsourced the light engine to InFocus, who is still in business today making projectors, and they kind of slacked off on the rest of the components which they engineered in-house. Specifically, the input front end was ripped straight out of one of their low-end CRT rear projection sets. This front end is not only completely analog in nature, but also doesn't support 720p video sources because the CRT rear projection sets that that originally was designed for didn't support 720p. So it was just set up to reject them. And that limitation unfortunately carries over into this 720p DLP rear projection television set which means that it may be one of the only 720p screens ever that doesn't support its native resolution. That's right, if you want to watch HD on this, the only HD resolution you can feed it is 1080i, which that formatter board will then scale down to 720p. As far as I know, this issue was straightened out in their redesigns of these sets for the following years, but the damage had still been permanently done, and as we can see here, still lives on to this day. The other side effect of reusing that analog front end is that, like I mentioned earlier, the DVI port is totally bogus. And that's not to say that it doesn't do anything, it does work, but right behind it is actually a digital to analog converter. So when you plug in a DVI source thinking that you're going to get a lossless digital picture on the screen, you have been deceived. Because immediately after entering the set, that digital video is converted back to analog and then goes to the formatter board where it's converted back to digital to be displayed by the light engine. So a lot of unnecessary conversion goes on here. Now to really drive this point home, I'm gonna paint a picture here of how this would look watching a standard 720p channel on cable. So say for example, you have your cable box that you rent from the cable company and you've decided to watch a 720p digital channel so that channel comes in digitally to be processed by the box. And say the box is plugged in through the HDMI port to the DVI interface of the television. The DVI interface tells the cable box that it only supports 1080i. So the cable box says, okay, well I can scale that. So it scales the 720p 
digital channel up to 1080i digitally and then sends it on its way through the digital interface. It gets into the television and then is immediately converted into an analog format. Then it makes its way to the formatter board where the now analog 1080i signal is converted back into a digital 720p signal. Now while none of these conversions by themselves are terribly lossy in nature, the combination of all this unnecessary conversion and scaling leads to a picture that's not quite as good as it could be. With all that considered, it still does look remarkably good, but one has to wonder what it could look like if it didn't have to go through all this butchering. Regardless of its impact on picture quality, the 1080i restriction also means that there are certain pieces of equipment that you will not be able to use with this set. Most notably, game consoles like the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox One that only support 480p, 720p, or 1080p. The Xbox 360 fully supports 1080i and will gladly scale all content to that resolution. And while I haven't personally had any experience with the PS4 and the Wii U, I believe they are also said to support 1080i scaling as well. The original Wii and PS2 are immune to this restriction since most of their games run at 480p. And the same can also be said for the original Xbox, on which most games run at 480p as well, although there are a few 720p and 1080 supporting titles. Again, this is mainly only an issue for newer equipment that does not support 1080i resolution. Finally, let's talk about the user experience. The on-screen menus and controls are comprehensive, responsive, and customizable. The settings are enabled per input and give you a wide variety of different controls and options, in addition to just the standard brightness and contrast. Some of the other features and goodies include stuff like sleep timers, wake timers, parental control, software updates over the internet, which no longer work because they stopped serving them up years ago, DVR functionality when you connect a Firewire-enabled hard drive, that only works when you're using the built-in tuner, and even settings for display in a retail environment, including the ability to force the set to automatically power itself back up after a power failure, and automatically return itself to a specific video source and volume level when it comes back on. In fact, when I got this, I noticed that the force power on after a power loss setting was enabled, and that may have been in part what caused the second lamp to die in it so quickly. There may have been a power outage at the family shack, and then after the power came on when no one was there, the set just ran and ran and ran and burned itself out. You also get full control over the network functionality, including the ability to assign a static IP and your own customized host name. Last but not least, we have the web browser. Don't get your hopes up, this isn't the world's greatest web browser. The browser functionality itself and possibly the entirety of the TV's system software is based on Windows CE 4. So it's the equivalent basically of trying to use a 15 year old PDA to browse the web. That's not to mention the fact that if you want to actually be able to do stuff like entering web addresses, you would have been required to purchase RCA's infrared keyboard remote. Now I don't have one of those, but I do have a wireless router with DDWRT custom firmware, which gives me the ability to fudge the DNS settings a bit. So I was able to make it redirect to sites like Google with varying degrees of success, mostly failure, upon trying to load most web pages. It was unsuccessful at loading any and all images Clicking most links either didn't work or provided an error of some kind, and often the whole thing would just crash and burn. The browser would just close itself out on me. Still, it was interesting to witness the functionality that may have made this one of the world's first smart TV sets. In conclusion, the RCA HD 61 LPW 42 DLP rear projection television set really represents the earliest growing pains of the DLP rear projection industry that started pretty much here 
and would last almost exactly a decade before its value would eventually be eclipsed by the dropping prices of flat panels. Still, DLP rear projection lives on in the used market and represents a great bargain for those of us who can't afford a 50 inch, 60 inch, or larger flat panel. And with that, I congratulate you on making it all the way to the end of this rambling video. If you're interested in more technical details, be sure to check out the technical and repair video that will be coming up as a follow-up to this. And be sure to stay tuned to the all-new Channel 2012 for the latest in reviews, guides, food, computers, general around the house, and other high-quality, high-definition uploads. Thanks for watching.